really, um, we had left off last time talking about China. We had said that uh, after some promising beginnings of monarchy in the sort of Yellow River region, uh, what we were saying was that China, uh, China's monarchy would dissolve, and really there would be a series of hard-fought civil wars. Again, we just said specifically you now that that sort of the art of war, we talked a lot about how these small wars begin to embroil China. And there's nothing like a large-scale government for quite some time. We had also said that many governments in this state of uh, really uh, desperation to try to find some way out of it, uh, they begin to give their ear uh, to different uh, philosophers and teachers. Uh, and uh, we had talked about the period of foreign states at the time of great learning in China, uh, which goes against the normal expectation that war does not tend to produce culture. In this case, it did. And the, of the many schools of thought that will emerge in China at the time, none would end up proving to be more uh, instrumental in uh, providing some way out of the period of foreign states than the school of legalism that we described. Uh, and uh, that's going to be particularly true in um, the one state of these many small warring states that would actually manage to uh, win the war and bring it together China. Now, to just uh, refresh your memory, because it's been a long time, we had said the school of legalism said, above all else, your loyalty is to the state, uh, not to your family, uh, not to anyone else. Um, we said that the school leaders and taught make sure to invest in agriculture and above all else probably war and anything else the state should not bother uh, to be invested in. Legals and taught have strong enforceable laws and go out of course and actually enforce them uh, once you create them. Uh, make sure you collect taxes from agriculture. And um, legalism, too, as it goes on as a school, it begins to push back against some of those conservative forces that it saw in Chinese families that they felt were holding people back from fully accepting uh, all of these teachings. Like, for instance, they felt that, well, the, the Chinese families have a lot of this pointless ritual. They love, have a love of sort of ornamentation and ritual forms that, in fact, is a negative thing. You should get rid of all this ritual because it doesn't help you think. Uh, they also talk, for instance, that um, there was this uh, hate in legalism for old legal, for old noble families, people who had good blood. Because the attitude becomes that these people are actually holding you back. Uh, in fact, one of the more appealing ideals uh, to us, perhaps, looking at legalism, was that they really uh, talk about a meritocracy. You, know, you should be choosing people based on talent, not based upon the fact that they have noble blood. <laughs> no one likes any of the other ideas practically in the modern world, but that one um, we, of course, uh, we recognize perhaps. Now, I told you the, these ideas of legalism were circulating throughout the Chinese speaking territories, but there was no China, there was no one government. What you get, in fact, is these series of small territories, and this actually simplifies matters a bit. Um, ruled over by individual families, all of whom were constantly warring with one another. You know, they were developing small armies to be able to attack their neighbors. And uh, the one of these various small states that is going to prove very important to the future is this westernmost one known as the Qin. And in fact, uh, it's a Q, but you, you pronounce as C-H. Uh, and uh, you'll notice if you listen, of course, that is where we in um, the Western world get our term China from, from this initial imported family. It's not where the Chinese actually get their term for China, I should say, but um, that's what we do. Uh, and uh, really, um, during the period uh, at the end of the Warring States, uh, and uh, after the period is over, um, we're going to see the Qin emerge as the winner of this long civil war. The precondition to winning the civil war was that uh, the Qin is the Qin uh, dynasty, the Qin uh, uh, region, really, uh, is going to really fully embrace legalism, and it's going to really uh, implement this series of reforms to make the Qin state 
the most powerful of these small regional kingdoms. Um, and uh, there, for instance, are going to say, listen, one of the ideals of this school of thought of legalism is agriculture is very important. Well, we don't do enough of it. So let's turn that around. Um, and um, they do make all of these um, uh, these sort of uh, appeals to other Chinese-speaking people. Come to our region. Uh, come and do your farming in where we rule. If you do, we'll give you free land, we'll give you tax breaks, uh, anything to try to attract more people to come out to the westernmost part. Because up until then, it had been too sparsely populated. But now, all of a sudden, that changes overnight. Uh, and uh, we really think that agricultural production in the Qin region now is beginning to go through the roof because there's so many new settlers. Um, in addition to uh, the Qin begin to use some of their tax money uh, to create new canals to get water to these farms to be able to produce that much more. We also see, again, this is another one of the policies of legalism, um, that the Qin had very little patience for these old noble families. Uh, and in fact, it works to undermine noble families. Um, and uh, instead, to try to find uh, people uh, who are competent to handle other bureaucracy. More than anything else, though, and this is really where we see a legalism effect as well, uh, the Qin state gets this idea now that the army is supposed to be one of the most fundamental things in the state. So what we're going to invest in uh, is the military. And so, in fact, this is the period in which uh, they take a lot of that tax money and they begin to convert it uh, into weapons. These are uh, these are arrows, or a whole lot more. Um, you're not going to believe me on this one. This is a crossbow. This is a crossbow if you took away all of the uh, wooden parts of the crossbow. Uh, that is all that's left over. Uh, but this was actually created during the Qin period. There's a lot of new weapons that are created, specifically made of iron, uh, some of which is still last, as you can tell, to some degree. Now, one of the benefits of uh, the Qin, just to show you again the map, because it's important here, um, that you notice the Qin are all the way out here in sort of the western part of these Chinese-speaking territories. They lived in a region that was bombarded by outsiders attacking their borders on a regular basis. And uh, so that may appear to be a problem to you, and it was. But uh, the Qin army had to be battle tested from, uh, from its very beginning because they had absolutely no choice. If they didn't defend their territories, they were going to be conquered by a group of outsiders that they considered a bunch of barbarians. Uh, and the, the good part about this is that. Um, their army was so well tested that finally when they vanquished all of these barbarians, uh, then they were able to uh, take those same skills that they had, had won in those battles and use them to begin to turn on all of the other small Chinese states. Uh, so China had to be conquered, really, uh, to forge a un unified state at this point. The great part about, too, uh, again, being in this situation which war had now been going on for so long, many of these small regional kingdoms, they, they didn't have enough sense to band together uh, to fight against the Qin. They were overjoyed when some of their uh, these other kingdoms begin to fall at the Qin's hands. But uh, the foolish part about that, of course, is that they were the next ones, usually. Uh, in line. And as the Qin conquered more territory, it became stronger and stronger. Uh, and really, there was no one who could stand against them in the end. So they actually do manage to fulfill their dream uh, and swallow all of the other little fishes until uh, they were the only ones left. Uh, and now, for the first time, China is going to begin to uh, create something that, in our terms, becomes a major empire rather than just a small kingdom. The first emperor who would uh, rise to power then after this huge conquest is shown here. Uh, this is uh, a man known as Jin Shi Huangdi. Um, a term is actually, uh, confusingly, this is actually a title. Uh, that term it means a first revered emperor. Jin uh, Shi Huangdi, uh, upon coming to power, said his 
uh, his family, his dynasty would rule for thousands of years. Uh, the actual number was closer to 14, uh, but you have to admire his ambition upon coming to power. Uh, that, that this was it. He was going to fundamentally uh, transform the political map of China. Now, the reason we're talking about this first dynasty, the Qin dynasty, is not so much that it itself lasted all that long. In fact, it did not uh, last all that long as a unified dynasty. The reason we talk about it is this is really the family that brings this new scale of politics to China, this imperial scale of politics. Uh, politics is no longer this small regional thing. They have to work on a much larger scale, and they begin to innovate in terms of the way that their government runs now, because they have to, uh, to be able to make a government of this size run. Okay. Some people would say, in fact, that the model, this model of imperial government that the Qin innovates in, uh, will last in China until the 20th century. So we're really talking about a, a really a long-running kind of government whatever you think about imperial rule. What Jim Shi Huang Di do, does when it comes to power uh, is that he immediately begins to slice up China uh, into smaller administrative units. Uh, and then he sends out all sorts of officials from his central government to rule over the territories that he now, uh, now has. He is a military man, part uh, So uh, all of these officials have a very strict hierarchy. Everybody knows who's better than who. There was, however, there's a lot of thought given to where do you send individual officials. One of the, the basic ideas was that they never wanted officials to go out to the same exact region where they came from initially, because the attitude was these people will be subject to bribery and corruption. So don't do it. You send out officials to Places that they didn't know well, so they didn't have a natural power base uh, where they were sent. We also sent Chen Shi Huangdi beginning to uh, go around and to level any fortresses or any uh, private army that still existed after his conquest to make sure that there would be no one left to stand against him. Part of this process, too, was beginning to create more roads. Again, roads are always a sign of empire. And to, to uh, facilitate movement of, first of all, the military, uh, but other things as well, you needed to have standard roads. On top of that, you also wanted to have defense from the outside. And um, it's in this period where the, the, the idea of having walls, defensive walls, against outsiders or foreigners in China was not a new one when this new dynasty comes to power. Their real innovation is to try to take some of these very disconnected walls that had already existed, connect them up, and create much more formidable uh, sort of defenses. Uh, and in fact, this is the origin of uh, what later on will come to known as the Great War of China. Uh, it did not start off great, but in time it gets to be. The initial wall was especially in the areas where they had the most trouble with nomadic uh, invaders, both in the north and in the west. Uh, but gradually it will grow. Um, we don't have a huge amount from how the wall looked before the Qin. Some of the few areas we have, again, we really think it was a Fairly modest wall when it starts out. Uh, really, uh, something of us, uh, again, earthen work and stuff like this. Um, we think little by little, though, um, you know, it's good to be a dictator because you can force people to work really fast. Uh, and um, this wall will grow to enormous size. Um, uh, and uh, eventually, it'll grow to 14,000 miles and really be a major defensive wall against any barbarians trying to take China. Uh, I, I, this is a bit of cheating, but I'm showing you a much later picture of um, how the wall would eventually grow to. Yeah? Those original photos that you showed, like how did they work? They looked really low to the ground. Yeah, in fact, um, and part of the reason why um, I, I hesitate to show you this is that um, this used to be much higher, uh, and probably a lot of the wall ends up um, Actual uh, parts of the, of the wall, the rock, and everything were taken away and reused. Uh, so um, you're seeing really just the, the base of, of the first wall. Um, so um, there's not much there. No.
of this is a modern photo, uh, again, of uh, uh, what from the Great Wall would stretch out to be. These are, again, uh, as, these are very uh, good as defensive barriers, um, not because they would stop nomads in their tracks. Again, I mean, it's not as if nomads are stupid. They can take down pieces of wall. But it slows them down plenty, and it gives uh, the Chinese a lot of time. They're looking at the wall carefully, uh, a lot of time to have warning to be able to, to uh, get together your own army. Uh, so even doing that uh, helps a lot against invasion. In spite of this new political stability, um, we think that the Qin Dynasty runs into its critics, um, especially um, intellectuals, academics, who are always complaining about one thing or another. Um, and in particular, many scholars of the time objected to the nature of this government. They said this is an autocratic government, which in fact it was. They also said it was a militaristic government, which again is, is, uh, was a true criticism. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Shin Shi Huang Di didn't want to hear people criticize him. And in fact, um, we know that he actually begins to take something of an activist stance to silencing his critics at any one who hated his regime. So the first thing he does um, is to have collected many of the great works of ancient Chinese uh, literature, history, philosophy, ethics, basically all the written material that they could get their hands on, um, save for some uh, small number of works from the legalist school and some histories that had been written by his own scholars. So this is an attempt almost to wipe out the past. You know, that one of the problems, in fact, is people are wasting, they're getting these ideas from all these books that existed. And, uh, it actually is quite a heroic story in many cases that uh, some intellectuals who refused to give up these books would hide them under penalty of being executed if they were caught. Others, believe it or not, actually went ahead and memorized uh, some of the great works of the Chinese past before they turned over the books. Uh, so, for instance, uh, like uh, Confucius', Confucius works, which may seem harmless today to you, uh, were seen as uh, being you know, works that were against the government, subversive. And uh, those are some of the works that were either hidden or uh, memorized. So they actually had to be reconstituted uh, after this regime was over. Uh, we didn't have them for a while, so anyway. Um, one of the great problems, however, uh, is that um, uh, even after these works were destroyed, many of the same scholars were, and uh, intellectuals were still criticizing the regime, which uh, enraged Chen Shi Huang Di. So he decided instead uh, that the easier way ultimately is just to, uh, to rid himself of critics, and he ended up taking around 450 of his most prominent critics and burying them alive, uh, which very quickly stopped a lot of the criticism, as you might well imagine. Nevertheless, uh, even after this, so these sort of brutal measures, Chin Shi Huang Di just keeps on uh, uh, in, uh, really enforcing this new kind of government and trying his best to unify a country that really previously had been very separate. Uh, so he uh, begins, for instance, to create a common currency that would hold for all the territories in China. He would create weights and measures that would be uniform. Uh, he would create a postal system, a system that would use the same roads the army used to be able to communicate letters. He also, again, this is a, an ideal directly in line with, um, uh, with legalism, he creates lots of new laws and standardized laws that are meant to hold throughout China. At this point, though, uh, this is actually quite interesting. Um, he runs into a, a problem when they can issue and post these new laws, which is to say that the Chinese language, the written form of the language, had not previously been standardized. Um, one of the, the, uh, the drawbacks to having all of these regional areas that were not in contact was that everyone had a slightly different way of writing Chinese. Uh, and the problem with that is that when orders were sent out or laws were posted, even those people who were literate really could not read them at times. They wouldn't use the same characters. Sometimes they would use the same characters, but they would use them to mean different things. And that is totally unworkable for a unified government. And what does the dictator do? 
you decide that that's it. You will not use any other scripts anymore in Chinese. You basically you unifies the Chinese language in one form of writing. And if you want to have any contact with the government, that's what you have to use from now on. The last thing that Chen Shi Huang Di does as he's preparing uh, for that, uh, that, that fair, fond farewell to the world uh, is he begins to plan his own uh, burial monument. And that, again, it should not surprise you at this point that megalomaniacs, as uh, you see, for instance, in Egypt, love to have really lavish tombs. But the Chen Shi Huang Di may take the cake uh, as being uh, really, just putting the uh, most amount of stuff into the ground to glorify himself. Uh, and uh, what he ends up doing is creating what we sometimes refer to as the Terracotta Army. Uh, not a literal army, uh, but a uh, using a uh, form of clay, terracotta. He uh, has his laborers craft this group of lifelike statues of the soldiers. Uh, who would basically be guarding him in the afterlife. Uh, they would, I can see them, they're all lined up for battle, uh, in essence. Uh, there are around 15,000 of these terracotta statues um, that are uh, all on the ground. Still to this day, uh, a lot of them guarding the emperor. And I uh, think the detail work on these things is incredible. Um, you can see um, armor, horses. Um, if you look very closely at their faces, um, the faces are different, which makes us think that they were actually using real people's models. Uh, or else, uh, uh, they, there was not one cookie cutter in my person that they just did a thousand times. Um, again, some of them, if you look closely, you can see they actually still have paint on them um, to show. Again, that's a good example that, that they some actually held weapons. Um, <laughs> this is just ridiculous. I mean, um, how much money and time they spent on this uh, this tomb? Unfortunately for Chen Shi Huang Di, despite all these fun preparations for the afterlife, um, we do think that very soon after he dies, uh, everything that he had started to create in this new empire begins to fall apart. And, uh, it may actually not surprise you that as cool as his tomb was, as cool as many of the things that he had built were, um, you have to understand how he got all of this labor. Which is to say, when peasants weren't working on their farms, he conscripted them, he forced them to go ahead and work on governmental projects. And really, in some cases, uh, he really we think he conscripted millions of workers uh, to begin to work on these products uh, for him. Uh, and uh, really with very little concern for their health. It didn't really matter as long as these things got uh, uh, got finished as fast as possible. And uh, yeah, I've only shown you a few examples. We also know that many things that don't survive, things like palaces, bridges, um, some of the other things I talked about, for instance, um, roads, um, canals, walls, all of these things require free labor. Uh, but um, that does not mean that anybody was happy about it. And in fact, the Chin regime, while they were in charge, uh, become steadily more unpopular. And not just, man, we're not just among the upper class. In fact, many of these lower class people who were forced to work actively hated this regime because all they knew of it was the fact that they had to give up a lot of their crops uh, and uh, they had to uh, do work. Uh, and, uh, although the Qin Dynasty, by the way, was very good initially of keeping taxes low, once they had conquered all China, there was no longer any reason to give anybody tax breaks because you know who else were they going to go to? Uh, so they ratcheted up the taxes enough uh, that people felt it. In any case, the the upshot of all this is that um, very soon after the first emperor of this new dynasty was dead, um, we see revolts beginning to uh, to really come out to the uh, all over China. Uh, and in particular, many of these revolts will go after some of the symbols of the old regime. They'll go to palaces that they were forced to construct, and they'll burn them to the ground. They'll find government officials who they knew would be particularly corrupt, and they'll kill them. Uh, and this begins to become more and more general. And in fact, the Qin court was taken, uh, was taken off guard by the fact of just how quickly these rebellions become a thing throughout China. 
Uh, and uh, we think that um, the, the only hope of quelling the revolt uh, was if uh, they used this enormous army that they had uh, to go and to, uh, to forcibly put people down. Uh, the problem was, and this is really when we think uh, the turning point of the revolt, uh, many of the generals who went initially were sent to, uh, to try to stop the rebellion actually end up joining the rebellion, in some cases leading it. And uh, once that happens, of course, there's nothing uh, keeping the chin uh, in power anymore. And so really, this first uh, unified dynasty of China dissolved in utter chaos. The real danger for China, though, was not just in the Qin dynasty guys, but in fact, imperial government, unified government, also goes with it. There was a really very real danger for a certain period of time that this was hit. Uh, and so we actually see um, some of those small regional kingdoms that still had an identity apart from the unified China beginning to break off during this time into a vault. And in fact, um, it, they may have destroyed the imperial disparity altogether. However, in this big however, um, what we begin to see here during this period uh, is the first example of what later Chinese historians sometimes refer to as the dynastic cycle. Oh, I'll explain what this means. Um, when people look at imperial China, later historians in China looked at it, um, what they saw was a very consistent pattern. And we really see uh, the first sort of uh, playing out of this pattern right at this point. What they said was, listen, uh, when it comes to imperial China, we see the same thing happening again and again. You see wars. You see China eventually being unified by war, which it was. You see a time of peace. Peace will lead to prosperity. And then, for one reason or another, you see a period of decay. Uh, political decay, social decay, they would even say moral decay. It all kind of comes at once. But then, the cycle repeats. And you see war again, then you see unification again, and so on. Uh, so, uh, in effect, um, this is the, the first time we see this uh, sort of a pattern playing out, then, is during the chaos at the end of the Qin Dynasty, where you see war. Uh, and the person now who will direct the wars, and in fact, may bring an end to the wars at the end of uh, uh, this period of the Qin, uh, is this guy here. Yeah, now it's Liu Bang, who really is, a, is the man of the hour uh, when things are stopping in chaos. Liu Bang himself, from what we know about him, was kind of a fun figure. Um, he was really someone who was born to a peasant family, where really, uh, really, by virtue of his own skills, going into the army, he slowly works his way up until he's a major power broker. Uh, but the, and uh, his importance, though, is that, especially as a general who commanded almost universal respect among his men, um, he, he thinks that he sees the, the problem and Shin begins to die out, all these, this, this chaos breaks out. And he's determined to make sure that um, they don't throw the baby out of the bathwater, uh, that they continue to have um, imperial China. It's just that he now is going to be the one uh, in charge of it. And, uh, we really think uh, Ali Obama, in many ways, is, is a, as I said, he's kind of a, one of the reasons why I think people liked him is he still, uh, he maintained some uh, uh, memory of the fact that he had started off low on the social ladder. He had a lot of sympathy uh, with people. Uh, he also was a kind of a fun uh, party to his group, big group for himself. So uh, people liked him on a personal network level as well. In any case, um, Liu Bang, because he had this loyalty of troops that was able to, in essence, reconquer China, put down all of those revolts. Uh, and uh, after he had done this, he was able then to install himself as a new emperor. And the goal of this new dynasty was not was to keep imperial, uh, imperial China, to keep it together, but uh, to dull the harshness of the Qin dynasty, to make sure the worst policies of the Qin got thrown out, so, so uh, imperial government could last a lot longer than it had before. Liu Bang creates his own dynasty. He refers to his dynasty as the Han dynasty, after his native territory in China. 
And uh, the Han Dynasty, unlike the Qin Dynasty, has a much longer, more successful uh, period in charge. And in fact, some people would say this is the, uh, the most influential of all Chinese dynasties, imperial dynasties. And, uh, just by the fact that they consolidate and they improve upon imperial government uh, as part of the reason they're able to do this, to stay in power for as long as they do. <laughs> Liu Bang is the emperor who brings this new government together. If I were, however, to choose one emperor who is probably most important uh, for the Han Dynasty, it's this guy here, known as Han Wu Di, um, who uh, in, in many ways was the greatest and uh, most energetic, certainly, of emperors. Um, he, uh, bizarrely for someone, uh, for a pre-modern ruler, he was actually emperor for 54 years, which is uh, unheard of for uh, rulers in this time period. Uh, and uh, altogether, this is someone who really comes to power with a vision, uh, and also uh, we think as someone who had a great love of war, uh, and was certainly willing to go ahead uh, and use war whenever necessary for his policies. Um, Han Wu Di was a, a student of the past, and he recognized that if the government just stayed in charge, people had to have some sort of attachment to them. And the way he tries to create a much more synthetic connection between the government and people is he tries to find good officials to run his government, to run his bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, in, in effect, um, he sends these people out to also different parts of China uh, so um, they can help to govern the region, to hopefully govern the conflict. And we think Han Wu had absolutely he didn't suffer fools well. When any of these officials messed up, he would just, uh, in many cases, he would actually have them executed to make it very clear uh, that uh, you are you have to serve uh, the people well. Because again, this is in part this is a fear of revolt. If you know, the officials are incompetent, um, the, the emperor won't be powerful very well. We also see uh, that Han Wu Di takes care. Uh, again, really. Uh, in some cases, invest in some of the things that uh, made imperial government popular. Uh, once again, he spends a lot of money in building roads, not as oppressively as before, but he does it. Builds new canals as well, some of which actually help, uh, both of which the roads and the canals, will help make it possible to circulate around China. It's a big plus. We also see. Um, to really finance uh, the officials, to finance these projects, he begins to levy taxes. Um, some on things like agriculture, trade, um, the, pr the production of crafts. Um, but he also, he actually, they're kind of um, they're innovative, at least some things that they tax. So for the first five, for instance, uh, there is an imperial monopoly on certain items. Only the government can produce certain things. Like, for instance, Iron and salt. If you buy those in China, you have to buy them from the government, which meant that the government uh, could actually pocket a lot of the money. <laughs> Even more important than these industries, uh, liquor. Um, the government is the only one who's allowed to sell liquor, which is fantastic because you know, people always want to drink. Uh, so they bought in tons of money. Um, we think that as um, as uh, this government is uh, getting uh, stronger, um, but we think that Han Wudi begins to see uh, that some of these officials are simply not up to the task. And he's always concerned about recruiting young men who uh, have enough talent. One of the ways he tries to remedy this problem is he begins to create, for the first time in China, imperial universities. Universities whose primary job is to train young men to be able to, to uh, get to a position where they could serve the government through civil service. Uh, so this is meant to be a feeder uh, for a government service. I had mentioned to you earlier, too, that um, Han Wu Di was someone uh, who had a great belief in war as a, as a, uh, a method as well uh, to resolve problems. And so he did. He did. Um, we know that, for instance, um, uh, in two hot spots, yeah, in both in Korea and Vietnam, uh, Han Wudi launches uh, military expeditions. 
Uh, here's Han Wudi on, on um, a military uh, expedition. We think, though, that the, the people who gave um, him the greatest trouble, uh, the, the people who really uh, end up causing him to use a lot of government resources, uh, are the people who come from slightly to the north of China, known as the Xiongnu. Um, that starts with X. Although the Xiongnu, the name will be unfamiliar to you. Um, what's actually very interesting about them is uh, this is finally the third appearance of the Huns. Um, this is actually, uh, this group probably, although the Chinese sources do not refer to them as the Huns, this is the same group that later on will attack uh, India and later on will, will also attack Rome. So in fact, this is probably the same group. Uh, certainly a group that comes from the same exact region we think the Huns came from, which is around Central Asia. Um, they speak a language uh, that is uh, akin to modern day Turkish, which again is what we know from the Huns. And everything about the battle techniques of the Shangdu appear to be just like what we know from the Huns. They're very good on horseback, um, they're very good with bows and arrows, and they're very good at raiding, pillaging, and killing people, uh, which is, they did a lot of in this period, especially in the northern parts of China. That is, they did a lot of it until, Sha until um, uh, the Xiongnu uh, really raised the, uh, the anger of Han Wudi. And Han Wudi really decides uh, that he can't really sort of like, you know, just dance around this problem, or just, as people have done in the past, you know, do little small expeditions to push back the Xiongnu, and then to just find out the next season they came back as strong as ever. Um, he figured that we're an empire, and if we have a, a, an empire, we ought to use the resources of an empire to deal with this problem. And so Han Wudi, uh, to fight uh, against the Xiongnu, uh, raises an army of around 100,000 troops, which in the pre-modern world is a lot of troops. Uh, and he stages this huge invasion to this, the region to the north and to the northwest. Uh, the Chinese-speaking territories. And, uh, trust me when I tell you that the, the policy on these raids, uh, not raids, but this invasion, uh, was one of just wiping people out. Uh, they got people who they thought were Xiong Nu, um, they would just kill them right out. And so, in effect, um, this does uh, eliminate the problem, although probably the most violent way possible, which was just to wipe out anybody uh, in, in sight. That the, uh, the result of all of this, though, uh, was that um, really for the first time, this region directly to the north of China, and even to some degree to the northwest, uh, now uh, comes under Chinese control as a result of military conquest. Uh, and uh, as I'll speak more about in a moment, that's important just from a military control point of view, but it also opens up a new lifeline for trade uh, for China. I'll talk more about it in a second. One of the other reasons why we care so much, specifically about the Han Dynasty, is not just now, again, about a, a much better political control than the Qin ever had. Uh, most people would also say that this eventually becomes a time of great economic prosperity in China. As in every single civilization we've studied before, um, most people still live uh, on the countryside, they still live in farms. Um, and uh, so uh, cultivating grain and vegetables. Although, um, again, peace allows for a lot more cultivation. And really, there's a lot more territory brought under cultivation. So there's a lot more food. We also see uh, that uh, certain industries become more important during this period. The iron industry in China, which I mentioned to you earlier, eventually becomes a government monopoly, uh, really uh, uh, becomes something that rapidly grows quickly. Um, all sorts of tools that you might use on a farm, uh, say shovels, uh, sickles, uh, spades, um, hoes, I mean the agricultural variety. Um, all of these things um, will come, will be really become a like commonplace throughout China. Um, whereas previously these have been things that were really restricted to a few people. Now we see even like, you know, uh, people who are farmers can actually afford uh, to have iron tools and to use them as part of agriculture. Um, and uh, in, in some cases, too, uh, there's a lot of um, 
tools for domestic use that again are made of iron uh, and when they become quite widespread. Uh, iron pots, uh, knives, scissors, needles, hammers, saws, all of these things now um, simply are produced in much larger numbers. And there's enough, uh, enough people have uh, you know, enough money uh, that they can actually purchase these things and use them on a regular basis. There, of course, however, um, having all this metal going around uh, is not just a question then of um, being able to uh, make life a little bit easier on the farm or in your house. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, again, I told you under the Han, there's this great emphasis on the military. And part of the success of that the military would enjoy uh, comes from the fact that they're now able to use good iron weapons to be able to create these things. Um, things like, for instance, suits of armor that can be pumped out. Um, we also we get to see things like um, arrows and bows uh, produced at mass quantity uh, to be able to uh, equip the army. As I mentioned to you earlier, too, um, once you get the time of peace, uh, sometimes you begin to see new industries beginning to develop for the first time. Uh, and, uh, the Chinese, on the whole, become very good at producing textiles and different kinds of clothing. And among the various um, textiles, none would become more important, uh, probably both within China and outside of China, uh, than the production of silk. And in fact, um, this is the first time I'm mentioning silk. Silk is going to become one of those products that is virtually synonymous with China. Um, and the silk industry uh, is, it's always a high-end industry. There's not a lot of it produced because it's, it's all talk at a moment, it's very labor-intensive. Uh, but uh, this becomes something that uh, internationally is known that you know, the Chinese make this stuff and they make it really well. If you want to get silk, you have to uh, go to the Chinese. Um, it's at this period that the Chinese really have to have gone under a, this really this long period of experimentation to figure out how to make silk, um, which apparently um, uh, it's not as easy as you may think. Uh, not only do you have to uh, get silk worms and figure out how to breed them, um, you also have to figure out what to feed them. Uh, and that's, you actually apparently have to feed them finely chopped mulberry leaves. Uh, to be able to get them to produce the right form of silk. And again, you can only imagine how many plants they had to stick in front of these stupid worms uh, to figure out what actually produced uh, silk, but they did it. You also then have to be able then to, uh, to take uh, their cocoons, uh, to be able then to, to have this form of raw silk, and then you have to figure out how to weave it and how to dye it. There's really a lot of steps to this process, uh, but once the Chinese managed to figure out all of this, um, they had this item uh, that was strong, it was uh, beautiful, it was luxurious. Uh, and everyone who was anyone in the upper class, not only in China, but many territories to the West, everyone wanted to get their hands on Chinese silk. So, for instance, you know, um, women in uh, India, in Rome, uh, they knew very well uh, this lore of Chinese silk, and they either tried to get their hands on it or possibly. Now, this wasn't, and then by here's people stretching out so. This wasn't just a question of, um, uh, again, people coming to try to get silk. I mean, one of the benefits of having silk is it allowed um, long distant merchants in China now to have a prized item that they could sell, and really to connect it with other items that were uh, valuable. And uh, this is where we first see the emergence of something uh, that we know as the Silk Road. If you look at the map for a moment, you'll notice, by the way, that the Silk, term, the silk Road is a bad term. Um, it's not just one road. In fact, even on the simplified map, you'll see it branches off. There's actually more than one Silk Road. Really, it's Silk Roads is a better term. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that you, okay, this, this, um, this road is forever uh, associated with silk. Um, but um, it's not just silk that is being traded. Uh, in fact, we see all sorts of uh, items that are high-end, expensive items begin to move uh, along the Silk Road. Silk Road. Altogether, we think that the Silk Road is a road 
that is very long in terms of the journey. Uh, it would take you around half a year uh, to get from one end of China to the Mediterranean. Um, it is also a road that is very dangerous. And one of the problems, of course, that uh, merchants run into is that uh, everyone knows if you're a merchant, you're traveling on the Silk Road. To make any money, you had to have items that were very expensive. So if you were a, let's say, a bandit, and you wanted to rob things, you go right after the merchants. Uh, which is why, in many cases, merchants will try to travel in large groups to protect themselves against that possibility. But they couldn't stop all uh, people uh, from robbing them. Now, I mentioned to you uh, that, uh, again, silk is the most important. Um, gradually, though, any item, any item that is uh, the high end becomes traded on it. Uh, so uh, spices, um, glass in certain places, jewelry, perfume, uh, certain high-end pottery, wine, all of these things will travel uh, along the Silk Roads. And you should just think that this is um, a Chinese thing. Uh, yes, there are a lot of Chinese merchants traveling to the West, but in fact, uh, merchants from uh, India, for instance, begin to get on the Silk Road. Merchants sometimes uh, from Rome and successor kings will also get on the Silk Road and go in the opposite direction. So you really see this interchange of different peoples uh, going along the Silk Road. Um, we see uh, not only does the Silk Road allow things to travel, though, we also think it allows uh, technology to travel. Um, in many cases, ideas that China have, like for instance, how to make a watermelon, uh, how to make gunpowder, all of these things travel along the Silk Road with these merchants and then make their way further to the West. Perhaps most importantly, um, the, uh, a technology that's going to later on become very important uh, that was invaded in China, but it's, uh, this is the creation of paper occurs during this period. Um, the Chinese begin to experiment uh, to try to find a cheaper uh, way to write things down that was more convenient than bamboo roots, a bamboo uh, uh, that they used earlier, or silk was too expensive. And so that's, that's when paper steps into the picture. They begin to use kind of tent or bark uh, or textile fabrics and try to figure out what is the best way to create a form of paper. Once they do, this too will travel along the Silk Road and eventually make its way out uh, to other civilizations. In spite of all of these great things, though, we do think that in time, a Han Dynasty uh, will begin to experience difficulties. Um, and uh, I mentioned to you that the Han were always fighting, and that's true. But in some cases, um, these military campaigns actually cause economic strain. They cost more than they take in. Uh, and uh, really, um, in desperation, then, we think that the Han Dynasty, because it has overspent on the military, then it has to find some way to raise enough money to uh, counterbalance that. Uh, and uh, they start to do uh, what one of the things that, of course, that it ha the people hate about the Qin, which is to say they ratchet up taxes considerably um, because they want to, they need extra money. Uh, in some cases, too, we'll see the Han, as the, the dynasty begins to go under, and they start to confiscate money uh, from people, just for no reason at all, uh, which enrages them. Uh, and uh, we think that they meant that in time, if there was much less money for merchants and other people to invest because uh, the government was sucking up so much of it. Finally, we also think another failure of the Han dynasty is that although there's certainly money circulating, civilization and made a lot of money, we also think that social tensions begin to ratchet up. And specifically, there is this chasm that exists between the rich uh, and the poor. Uh, the poor, in fact, become even poorer during the Han Dynasty, uh, whereas the rich actually become richer. Uh, one way you can see this is that um, from the Han period, believe it or not, we have rich people who end up being buried in jade suits, jade from top to bottom. Um, you are officially too rich when you can afford a jade <laughs> suit to be buried in. That's the um, the, the end result of all of these tensions uh, was that, in effect, um, factions begin to grow up in the Han state and the central government. They begin to fight one another. Government becomes completely paralyzed. Uh, and because the government is so ineffectual, 
uh, to many of these large regional areas that had been unified under the Han begin once again to slip away. Uh, so we essentially end this lecture exactly where we began. Well, once again, these regional communities are beginning to come away. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I